Hello, and welcome to another episode of JJ Adventures in Traveling. Today's episode, we're sightseeing in Seattle before and after our Alaskan cruise. So if you like this video, please click that like button and subscribe to my channel. It really helps me out. Now on to today's episode in Seattle.
Uh, we're going to start our live area demonstration now. You already see some live blown glass. Yeah. Woo! Loving the energy. <laughs> okay, well, welcome to uh, Julie Garden Glass. We're so glad that you're joining us at the community hot shop. Hot shop just turned glass what is happening. Space they work in. The shop is literally hot. We're working some really high temperatures up here. We call this the community hot shop. We like to take what we do here and get back to the community. I'll talk more about that after the demonstration. Real quick for some safety things. This is going to take about 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the demonstration, please hold those until after the demo. We have plenty of time to talk about glass and we love talking about glass. Plus, we might answer your questions at some point in the demonstration. Uh, we have a roll from the front up here. That's our safety line. There's no proper safety line. That is for your safety. And finally, if you see any glass or any tools that fall from the stage, please do not touch them. They're likely hot or sharp or both. It's never happened in the eight years we've been doing demos. Have this 1967 Airstream. We're not expected to start today. But if it does happen, please don't worry about it. We will take care of it ourselves. And right now, we are safe. On to our team. Uh, Lee Glassport for this demo is going to be the amazing Matt. Can we give Matt a warm welcome to the stage? the gaffer which means he's going to sit at this bench right here and he's going to direct the size shape and color of the piece we'll be making before your very eyes he also tells the team what to do today the team is going to be a can we give Ava a warm welcome <laughs> he's going to be helping out making sure the piece looks beautiful before we put it in our oven at the end of the demonstration and finally my name is Parker I'm going to be the narrator I'm going to try to stay out of the way thank you everybody. All right, we're getting started. Matt has in his hands a steel pipe. It's a big metal straw. He's using that to get a gather of molten glass out of our melting furnace. The melting furnace is sitting at about 2,200 degrees Fahrenheit or 1,200 degrees Celsius for you metric folks, which means that glass is a little bit hotter than your right now. You'll notice as Matt stops turning the pipe, it starts dripping down towards the ground. That's because it's very, very hot right now. That means that Matt needs to constantly be turning the food at all times during this process. If he stops turning at any point, it will start going down to the ground. If we let it go all the way down to the ground, it's going to burn a big hole in our stage. We're not going to let that happen. We're going to turn this into a beautiful work of art. Our next step is to put a bubble on the inside of this glass. Right now it's a solid piece of glass. That bubble is going to be the inside of whatever vessel Matt is making. So he's going to be shaping this up with some tools. We like a specific shape when we're doing this because we want that bubble to be even spaced out on all sides. We also want the glass just a little bit colder than 2,200 degrees. Now has anybody seen glass one before? Right, couple of you. Well, if you haven't seen it before, this part's pretty cool. So check this out. I want everybody's eyes on the glass up top here. Matt's going to put a little air at the end of his blow pipe and tap it in with his thumb. And I have nowhere to go but into the glass and see a bubble in about three, two, one. All right. Done silence for the crowd. That's always exciting for us to have to the start of whatever it is we're going to make. So we're going to make sure we've got but we are going to keep moving on in the process. Our next step is to get more glass. Right now we have about enough glass to make a little cup. We want to make something a little bit bigger for you folks. So Matt's going to be going back into the melting furnace. First, we've got to let that bubble cool down to about 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it's very cold for us glass blowers. We never really get to let the glass get any colder than 1,000 degrees. But we know it's also cold enough that that bubble's not going to twist or collapse when we go into that very hot furnace. Uh, if you were to make something as big as the mafia, the food and bowls on the mafia floors, you go to that melting furnace about five or six times. We're going to go in once more. That'll give us something similar in scale to the pieces we have on the table in front of the stage here. Now you'll notice at this point the glass has lost a lot of that orange tint. You'll also notice as Matt stops turning the pipe, it's not going anywhere. Both good indicators is about 1,000 degrees. But the best indicator is the sound check. That's exactly 1,000 degrees. All right. <laughs> So this will be Matt's last trip to the melting furnace. Now this is a relatively small melting furnace. Someone like Dale Chihuly would have a couple of furnaces that hold about a thousand pounds of molten glass. Ours holds about 200 pounds. So that works great for us up here. So we've got the material that we need now. Because we only melt uh, clear glass on this stage, we're going to start applying uh, color using what's called frit. It's spelled F-R-I-T. It's a crushed up glass that you can get in various colors. See the selection we have available to us in front of the card there. All Matt has to do is roll the hot glass from the end of his pipe over the crate on the table. It's going to melt all those tiny little pieces just enough to get them to stick to the surface of the glass. That's going to give Matt a layer of whatever color he chooses. Looks like we're starting out with a pigeon bread in his first roll. Right now, Matt's got the piece of what we call our reheating furnace. It's a big bear of fire. It's like a 50 gallon oil drum on the side filled with flames. That's going to heat up our glass when it gets too cold. Once again, we don't want to let it get below 1,000 degrees. Start out with that gray. Now Matt went over a, a transparent dark blue on the outside. You get asked quite a bit what makes the uh, how we get the different colors in our glass. Uh, the glass is made up of different metals and metal oxides that will make those colors. So that blue probably had a lot of cobalt in it. That'll help make that blue color. 
Is that going to be input about that? Yeah. Okay, so we've got the color we need, we've got the material we need. Next, we're going to see Matt sit down at the bench here. He's going to use a very special tool to shape this glass up. Now, when you, uh, you're blowing glass, it's very important that your glass is on the center of your blowpipe. That way we know our piece is going to be symmetrical all the way around. When you're rolling your glass in crit, there's a chance that bubble gets knocked off center. We're going to see Matt use what's called a block in just a second here. The block is a big, wet wooden spoon. It can give us an ideal shape that we need out of the glass. That ideal shape is carved out of the spoon area here. That's going to round out all the sides of the piece, making it symmetrical all the way around. And most importantly, it's going to center all that glass up on the blowpipe. That's giving that a puff of air. Anytime you see Matt hanging the pipe down, it's going to stretch the glass out to the ground using gravity, making the piece a little bit longer. Now Matt is cooling down the glass. Anywhere that that glass is touching the table, it's going to get colder because that metal is going to suck the heat out of the glass. So when Matt inflates this back end here, that's going to get bigger. That back end is eventually going to be the top of our piece. That point of tip that he made uh, is going to be the bottom of our vessel. Now, glass is very much a team sport. It's a difficult thing to do by yourself, so it's always nice to have an extra set of hands. We're going to see Cup A coming out a little bit more actively as the assistant. He's going to be on the far end of the bench, inflating air into the blowpipe. Well, Matt uses a bunch of tools to shape this up. We're going for the general size and shape of the piece right now. Matt's taking a very important tool called a pair of jacks and he's incising a line just off the head of the blowpipe. The jacks is one of our most versatile tools as glass blowers. Uh, you're not going to see this tool anywhere else except in a hot shop. These are for glass blowers specifically. Now that is, uh, that constriction that Matt made off the head of the blowpipe. That's called the jack line, and the jack or the jack or the neckline constriction. We're going to use that when we're ready to take this piece off the blowpipe, and we want to start working on the top. That's an important part of all pieces of blown glass. No matter what you're making, whether it be a bowl, a vase, or an octopus, you need that jackknife constriction to make a controlled break right there. You can take this off the floor back. Now we saw Matt use this tool just a little bit earlier. It's a super fancy little flexible pad. We call this the Seattle Times newspaper. <laughs> very high-tech piece of equipment. It's a great way for getting a hand feel for the glass without burning yourself. Keep in mind, this is sitting at about 2,000 degrees each time Matt sits down. Trust me, you do not want to put your bare hands on that. We don't feel any of that heat with the newspaper. Now, the reason I say it's a super high-tech piece of equipment is because all the tools you're going to see Matt use on the stage here have been in glass blowing for a long time. Glass blowing is an old art form, and the tools have not changed up all that much. So if you look at pictures of glass blowers from a thousand years ago, you're going to see the jacks. They're going to look pretty much the same as they do today. They haven't changed up all that much. So that makes the newspaper one of our more modern technologies. It happens to be one of our cheaper tools, too. One of our more modern tools that also came out, I think this is the most recent addition to the glass blower tool, is what A is holding in his hands right now. It's a little pocket puffer. It's kind of like the uh, same little puffer that they used to do for blood pressure reading. We use that uh, because of COVID. We didn't want to put our mouths on the blowpipe, sharing blowpipes. Uh, we still use it today. It's actually pretty nice for demonstrations. We uh, don't have to crouch down and blow it through the blow pipe. And it gives us a pretty good steady stream of air. If A was blowing into the pipe during his lungs, he actually wouldn't be blowing that hard. A lot of people think you need a lot of breath power in order to blow glass. But because the glass is so soft and it's heated up, A is blowing about the same amount of breath power it would take to blow bubbles out of a bubble one. He's not blowing out any birthday food. This is a great example of what the newspaper can be used for right here. Matt wanted to make a constriction well, towards the bottom of the piece. And he didn't want to make that constriction with the jacks because it would be too precise. This gives us more of an organic constriction. This is going to be what we call a wasted foot. I like to call it a Coke bottle foot. It's kind of like a Coke bottle foot. It's a little bit wider towards the bottom of the piece. Uh, the more people you have on a team, the more you can get done. So we might actually see me get to help out. Sometimes Matt likes to let me help. We're going to be making the bottom of the piece pretty soon here. Uh, once we have the bottom of the piece put in, we're about 50% done with our piece and we'll be able to move on to the next step. Hello? Hello. So we're going to do a little bit more shaping. Now, to make the bottom of the piece, we're going to see one of us use a wooden paddle. It's probably one of the first tools you would have seen in the history of glass. It's great for making things flat, it's great for blocking heat and hitting your skin. It's a pretty versatile tool for us. A lot of people are surprised that we use so many wooden tools in glass blowing. We're dealing with some high temperatures, so you think we've burned through everything pretty quickly. A lot of our tools are soaked in water, that helps last a little bit longer. We also use a specific wood grain. 
uh, that uh, usually wood from a cherry tree has a very dense wood grain, so that also helps it last a little bit longer. But we use wood tools for a couple of reasons. One, metal can be kind of harsh on glass. If you're not careful, you can scratch the glass and make what's called tooling marks with metal tools. Wood is very soft on glass, we like to use that instead of Yeah. Looks like we're making the bottom now, paddling. Got everybody working together to make a nice, clean bottom there. Nice. Yeah, it looks like we're ready to move on to our next step. Now we need to take this piece off of the blowpipe. We effectively need to flip it around 180 degrees so we can start working on the top here. So Ace going to be getting a little bit of glass off the melting furnace and making what's called a punty. He's going to shave that up on the table to make a little pointy tip on the end of the, uh, the rod there. Then we're going to stick that onto the bottom of the piece that we just made. Then we're going to utilize that jack line constriction to get that controlled break, flipping this piece around so we can start working on the top. Now this move is what we in the business affectionately call the tricky part. <laughs> and you need to have the right timing, otherwise this will not work and this piece is going to come crashing down to the ground. This is also the part of the demonstration where I need some help from all of you folks in the audience. We get this knock off the blow pipe onto that punchy and does not come crashing down to the ground. We need a big round of applause from every single person here in order to have these two keep making glass. It's very, very important. And if it does come crashing down to the ground, that's going to be the end of our demonstration. So punchy on the bottom of the piece. While they're still keeping that punty, Mac can move around with some tweezers, trying to get that as close to the center of the bottom of the piece as we can before we break this off the blow pipe. All right, check this out, folks. A little water on the jack line constriction. And a light tap, and that is all. Woo! All right, nicely done. So A is going to be getting a little heat on the piece before he brings it back to Matt at the bench. It's kind of a maintenance heat. We want to make sure that stays above 1,000 degrees. This is mainly going to heat up that punty because the rest of the piece is cold enough that Mac can use some tweezers to wrench it around without making a mark on the surface of the glass. To be able to make sure that punty is on the exact center of the bottom. If it was not on the exact center of the bottom, our finished product would probably look like it's sitting at an angle. I see some weird shapes going on in the lip or the sidewall. It also might just not look symmetrical all the way around. Once again, it's very important to be on center for the glass. Alright, so now we're going to be doing a move called trimming the lip. It's one of the bigger hurdles to get over uh, when you begin blowing glass. There's a lot of extra glass on the lip of the piece, and that's because of that jack line constriction that Matt made earlier. So when he sits down next, we're going to see him use a pair of tweezers to pinch out all that extra material on the lip. And while it's still hot, Matt's going to use a pair of shears or metal scissors to cut that extra material up. You've never seen someone cut glass with scissors before. It's pretty cool. It's not something you see every day. Now we all know how to use tweezers, we all know how to use scissors, but when the thing that you're cutting is over the side of the bench, it's about 2,000 degrees. It's a lot harder actually to get that cut even all the way around. This usually takes years to be able to do consistently. There's really no good, good way to practice this except making a piece of glass, going through the motions until you get to this step, and then practicing that trim. So pitching out that extra material on the lip, making a little crown up there, and that's going to use uh, newspaper to even out those sides. Looks like he's going to get a little bit more heat. We want to make sure that we're hot enough when we cut this. If you're too cold while we cut this, you feel like going into your kitchen and grabbing the glass out of the cupboard and trying to cut it with some scissors. I don't know if anybody here has tried that. I do not recommend it. It does not work very well. The more heat we have in this glass, the more we can manipulate it, the farther we can stretch it out, the faster we can cut it. We've also got Ace standing by some wooden paddles. He's going to use that to block any radius heat from hitting Matt's fingers. He can ask quite a bit if we burn ourselves up here. Uh, the truth is, when you start out, you learn pretty quickly where to grab and not grab where you don't burn yourself. But sometimes you can't get away from that radiant heat from your skin just being inches away from 2,000 degree glass. It doesn't feel very good. We can use that wooden paddle to block some of that heat. So Matt can focus on what he's doing. Now this is a relatively small piece. If it was much bigger, you'd probably see Matt wearing a sleeve all the way up his arm. They would probably have bigger paddles in his hands. But this is pretty small, so we're going to stick with those two wooden paddles in my body. Alright, let's have a good Now there's still all sorts of tools and techniques that can be applied to this piece. All sorts of things that can be uh, put into the lift. It's all up to the gapper. It's all inside Matt's head. It's going to give us a little hint each time that he sits down. But I noticed the working time of the glass is pretty short. Matt only has about a minute each time he sits down on the bench before he has to get up and go back to the reason the first. That means each time Matt's sitting down, he has to know exactly what he's going to do in the time that he has. He can't be making any decisions or changing his mind after he sits. Now typically when he's here at the review turns, he's thinking about what his next moves are going to be. 
That being said, Aiden and Matt are going to make this look pretty easy. They're both very talented glass blowers. They've been doing this a while. It's not easy to work with glass that's this thin and this hot. Especially to make a piece this size about 15 to 20 minutes. It's going to look pretty easy. This is years of glass blowing experience you're watching on the stage. Looks like Matt made a constriction towards the top of the piece. It's going to create a little cup up there. All sorts of things you can do with that. For instance, we can see Matt use what's called a sofietta. A sofietta, also called a puffer, is a metal cone with a straw attached. You can insert this cone into an opening in the glass. You're trapping all the air on the inside. And you can use the mouthpiece with the straw to give it a puff of air. It's really the only way to inflate a piece of glass once it's been knocked off the blow pipe. Hey, is standing by with a wooden paddle once again. This time, instead of using it to block him from hitting Matt's skin, he can put that up against the lip of the piece to keep that flat. Now the angle that Matt is pushing the jacks is going to determine how much that lip flares out. He's going to go back and forth between that constriction on the outside and the opening of the glass on the inside. So what we call a flared lip. Alright, I like it too. I think we're done with this piece folks. What do y'all think? Woo! Silver doors behind me here. This is something called our annealer oven. It's an oven that's sitting at about 950 degrees Fahrenheit. It's going to hold all the glass that we make for today at a certain temperature where it's not going to get too hot and melt. It's not going to get too cold and crack. Then when we go home, we'll run a program that sets that temperature down overnight. It's going to cause a molecular change to happen in the glass. We'll pull this piece out tomorrow. It won't be so affected by temperature change. If we were to leave this piece out without putting it in that oven, however, within a matter of minutes, it would get too cold too quickly and it would shatter. Something all pieces of glass have to go through. That includes all the pieces you saw in the exhibit. That includes any glass you might have at home. Even your cups that you got from Ikea. You have to sit in there and up. I hope you enjoyed today's episode and please stay tuned to my channel for more adventures. See you then! As always, if you like my videos, please think about subscribing to my channel. Click the notification icon to get notified when I post new videos. Smash that like button on this video if it really helps my channel out. And if you have any comments on my video, please enter them below.